Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are going to continue our second part of Chapter 23. Uh, we are continuing where we left off in the last class this past Tuesday. Uh, we had discussed the uh, divisions for this company. We discussed revenues, operating expenses, department charges, service department charges, um, and income from operations. This is very similar to one of the homework questions that you'll face uh, in Chapter 23. So just to kind of take note of how this looks. Uh, and you'll experience this in, in one of the homework questions. Okay, so let's talk about the rate of return on an investment. In finance, and, you know, this, this is uh, – a truly a finance course, but in finance, we have this thing called a return on an investment. As an investor, I want to see what, what I call a return on my investment. This is typically done by like an interest rate or, um, or a payment plus interest. So like if I, if I were to lend you money, I would expect you to not only pay that money back, but also pay uh, a return on my investment, which is a form of an interest payment. And and so it's very similar with respect to a return on investment. Because investment center managers control the amount of assets invested in their centers, it should be evaluated based on the use of those assets. Uh, one way we can think about this from a, uh, I guess, a retail perspective is how quickly – the, um, how quickly the inventory is being sold would be a measurement of this. So one measure that considers the amount of assets invested from an investment center is the rate of return on the investment or rate of return on assets. Now, the way we calculate ROI or return on our investment is so we take our income from operations and we divide that by our invested assets. We'll talk about invested assets here in a second. Um, I wanted to go back to this. So, so you can see on the bottom we have our income from operations. That's derived by taking our, our revenue minus our operating expenses to get our uh, revenue minus operating expenses equals income from operations before service department charges. And then we have our service department charges. We take our income before operations. Income from operations before service department charges, subtract out your service department charges to get our income from operations. And so what we do is uh, to get a return on investment, we take that income from operations amount, and we divide that by our invested assets. So think of invested assets as being your total assets, uh, and you'll, you'll be able to find that on the balance sheet. As you remember, uh, you, on your balance sheet, you have uh, your assets, your liabilities, and your and your um, equity. Okay. So the, the rate of return on asset on investment is useful because the three factors subject to control by divisional managers are revenues, expenses, and invested assets are being considered. So, so basically what this tells us is we can determine the effectiveness of divisional managers by looking at how they're utilizing and controlling their revenues, expenses, and invested assets. The higher the rate of return on an investment, the better the division is utilizing their assets to generate income. So the way that we utilize assets to generate income uh, from a retail perspective, it's how we are selling our inventory. From a manufacturing perspective, which is what we're looking at for, uh, for the purposes of this course, is we're looking at how we are utilizing our machines and the, our, our materials, our raw materials, work in process, and our, our, um, our finished goods. So those are, those are assets that the company utilizes to generate income. So in effect, the rate of return on investment measures the income or the return on each dollar invested. 
so, so a way to think about this is going back to our, our blue jeans example that we had uh, in the last chapter. If we think about that example, the dollars invested in the blue jeans was the purchase of the materials, right? And so the, the return on the investment was the revenue that the company received from the sale of each pair of blue jeans. So as, as, as a result, the rate of return on the investment can be used as a common basis for comparing divisions with each other. Are there any questions so far? Nope. Yeah, Dr. B, no good question. question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, would dividends be a rate of return for your investment? Uh, would dividends be a rate of return for investment? Uh, so dividends are what the company pays to, to shareholders, right? And um, so, so we would not measure dividends as, as being a, a component of ROI or return on investment. And the reason being is because uh, the um, the cash that we receive, the company receives from the investors. Is, is utilized, but we don't use uh, dividends as, as, a, as a measuring factor. And the reason being is because the dividends are what the company pays to its shareholders. So, so to answer that question, from this perspective, no. But uh, we would look at dividends um, as um, a component of how well the company is performing. So, okay. so a short-term answer there is no. Thank you. Very good question. Okay, so let's look at uh, an example here. We, uh, Data Link is a, is a uh, company that provides uh, internet service. So the invested assets of Data Link is in three different divisions. We have the northern division, central, and southern divisions. The uh, invested assets needs division is, are as follows. We have 350,000 uh, in invested assets for the Northern Division, 700,000 for Central, and 500,000 for the Southern Division. Uh, so let's figure out what our ROI is. Um, so the return on the investment uh, for each division is measured as follows. We take our income from our operations and we divide that by our invested assets. For the Northern Division, the income from operations was 70000 We divide that by the invested assets of 350000 to get an ROI, or return, or, uh, rate of return on our investment, at 20%. Everyone sees how we got there? Yep. Yep, great. So, so again, we're just taking our income from our operations, we're dividing that by our invested assets, to get the percentage, uh, which is the rate of return on our investment. And you'll do the same, that same process for each division. Now, as you can see, uh, it looks like the Northern Division is utilizing their assets the best. And the re reason I say that is because you, we can see that they have a higher rate of return on their investment in comparison to the other divisions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Now, uh, this formula is probably one of the more challenging ones. We're really getting, when we talk about return on investment, th these formulas are more uh, finance driven than anything else. Um, in our program, I don't think that we have a finance course that is solely based on this, but uh, I know that the upper upper division does. So if you if you go on to get your bachelor's degree, I'm confident that you will take a finance course that uh, will go through these a little a, a little bit deeper. So for those of you who are uh, looking to pursue your bachelor's degree um, in business, you will certainly see these formulas again in your finance course. So it's important that you uh, take note of it here. So uh, to analyze difference, the differences in the rate 
and the rate of investment across the divisions, we use this thing called the DuPont formula uh, for the rate of ret uh, return on the investment. The DuPont formula, just a little bit of background on it, it was the formula was actually developed by the DuPont company. Uh, for those of you who probably are familiar with the name, it, uh, they are a paint and chemical company that they've been around for the better part of uh, about 200 years now. And uh, this formula has been utilized in mo modern financial theory since uh, the early 1930s. And so uh, it's, it's pretty widely well known. And I just wanted to provide you with that context of what, where this formula came from because uh, the DuPont was – uh, one of the first companies to be publicly traded um, on, on the Dow Jones Industrial. So the DuPont formula views the rate of return on investment as the product for the following two factors. The profit margin. You, you guys remember the profit margin from previous chapters. This is the ratio of the income from operations to sales. And then we also have the investment turnover. This is the ratio of sales to invested assets. So we just kind of talked about the previous slides. Okay, so let's, let's look at these uh, formulas in action. The DuPont formula, the rate of return on the investment is, is calculated by the following. First, we uh, get our rate of return on the investment by taking our profit margin and multiplying that by our investment turnover. The rate of return on the investment is calculated by taking your income from operations divided by sales, and we multiply that uh, by sales divided by your invested assets. I, I think that we are missing our um, emphases, right, the order for the order of operations. So before you just multiply these things together, you need to do one at a time, okay? So the first thing you do is do your income from operations divided by sales. You will get that amount. Then do your sales divided by your invested assets. And then once you have both of those numbers, you will multiply them together. So what I'm saying here is that there, we're missing the parentheses uh, in, this, in this formula. So, again, you want to do the division before you do the multiplication. So, division and division before multiplying. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, you definitely want to do that uh, because uh, I think there's one question in the homework that utilizes this formula. And so, just keep that in mind uh, as you're working through the homework. So the, the DuPont formula is useful in evaluating the divisions, as, as we just discussed. This is because the profit margin and the investment turnover reflect the, op, the operating relationships of each division. We look at the profit margin as indicated uh, uh, to tell the profitability by computing the rate of the profit earned on each sales dollar. If a division's profit margin increases, all the other factors remain the same, and the division's rate on the investment will increase. The opposite is also true. Investment turnover indicates operating efficiency by computing the number of sales dollars generated by each sales dollar of the investment. That's a crazy sentence. All this is telling us is that if the division's investment turnover If the division's investment turnover increases, all of the other factors will remain the same, and the division's rate of return on the investment will increase. It's best to show you what an example. Okay, so let's look at this example. Okay, using the DuPont formula, yields are the same rate of return for investment for each of data lake's uh, divisions. And here's how it looks. So using the return on investment, we got our income from operations of 70000 for the Northern Division. The Northern Division sales were 560000 
So we do that first, right? That, that gets us 12.5%. So 70,000 divided by 550,000 is 12.5%. And then uh, we take our sales, 550,000, divided by our invested assets of 350,000, which is 1.6. And then so to get our rate of return on the investment, we take our 12.5% times 1.6, which gets us to 20% for our rate of return on investment. Everyone see how we got there? Yes. But right. the only thing I was wondering is if we're planning on investing. Yes. How can we get all this information to see what kind of rate of return we'll get? Great question. Yeah, so so you'll be able to get this information from the 10K reports. So if you go to if you go to sec.gov, which is the Securities Exchange Commission's website, and you can search for the company that you're interested in investing in. Uh, within there, you'll be able to find this report. It's called a 10K report. And the 10K report is the company's financial performance for that previous year. And that within that previous year's data, you'll be able to see the company's income statement, balance sheet, statement cash flows. And as you know, you'll be able to find the uh, sales data and income from operations data on the income statement. And you'll also be able to find the invested assets on the balance sheet. And so once you extrapolate that data and you run a form, run this formula using that data, you'll be able to determine the rate of return on the investment. And so uh, that is a, one way of determining if the company is worth an investment or not. Okay. And, and so another way to do it is there's a website uh, that, believe it or not, it's Yahoo. <laughs> she talked to that company and was still around. But um, it's called Yahoo Finance. And Yahoo Finance is, uh, is a great website, and it, it provides a, a lot of this information already for you. The, the website uh, includes a lot of these calcul types of calculations under the Finance tab. And so, uh, so if you search, if you go to Yahoo Finance and you search for the company that you're interested in investing in, you'll be able to find, uh, these types of calculations already done for you. And so, uh, that will also help you to determine whether a company's worth an investment. Does that help to answer your question? Can you repeat the first question? Yeah, it's, uh, sec.gov. That's the Securities, Ex U.S. Securities Exchange Commission. And on that website, uh, if you go to the top right corner, there's, there's a search box, and, and you can actually search for the company's uh, listings, uh, the company's reports. And um, it's a pretty good website. It's very, very well detailed. Uh, that website will only provide you with information on companies that are publicly traded, uh, and it provides you with all the financial data. It's a great, great website. I, I use that one all the time when I'm uh, when I teach my MBA course, and I and I also use it uh, to determine if a company's worth an investment or not for my for my personal portfolio. And then you may also want to uh, uh, definitely take a look at that uh, Yahoo Finance website. That one's really good as well. We got a little sidetracked there, but it's 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 worth talking about because you know all of you are at the point of, uh, where you're interested in that type of stuff. So I'm, I'm, that was a really, really good conversation. So I thank you for that. Okay, so let's let's proceed. Okay, to increase the rate of return on an investment, the profit margin. An investment turnover for a division should be analyzed. Okay. So, so basically what this tells us is if the company is underperforming when it comes to the rate of return, uh, for various divisions, we want to look at ways where we can raise that by, um, 
either increasing sales or, or further utilizing our assets. And so let's look at uh, the company's northern division. We could increase it, the northern division by $56,000 through increasing operating expenses, such as advertising of $385,000. So as you, as you know, the uh, well, typically, the more a company spends on something like advertising, it should ultimately result as, in an increase in sales. That's why companies advertise all the time. You, you see those car commercials running every couple of uh, segments, right? And so the reason why car, car companies advertise so heavily is to get uh, more cars sold. Of course, that's the whole concept behind advertising. And the same can be said for other uh, other products. Uh, did you know that the in the United States um, the most heavily advertised product ever is the credit card? It uh, is by far the most heavily advertised product uh, ever in, in the history of the United States. And the reason for that is uh um, you talking about in terms of like like debit cards or like just credit credit cards. Just credit cards. So so like you know, Capital One is oh, right, right, notorious right, right, right. for their advertising. Uh you got Discover, you got yeah. you know, all the all the other uh and, and I, I certainly recommend that you stay away from credit cards as much as possible. <laughs> okay. Those are dangerous. All right. Um, but the reason I say that is because you're used to, you, you have to pay that back, right? And, and you get penalized when you use a credit card in the form of interest. Okay? And the interest rates are ridiculous. They're like 30%. So please, stay away from that stuff as much as you possibly can. Um, as much, if, if you have to, if you're up to that position where you have to take out a loan for whatever reason, it's better to take out a personal loan than it is a credit card. Because because of the major difference in interest rates, so just food for thought there. Anyway, um, I, I, so I'm sorry about that. I, I digressed a little bit, but uh, so let's go back to our example. So the company increased their expenses uh, for for advertising. The Northern Division income from operations will increase from seven thousand to seventy-seven thousand, and we compute that by the following: we take our revenue. Of five hundred and sixty thousand plus fifty six thousand, which uh, uh, increased as a result of our increased advertising, the revenues are now six hundred and sixteen thousand. Operating expenses rose to three hundred and eighty five thousand with the increase in advertising. That gives us an inc income from operations before service department charges of two thirty one. We got 231000 by taking our revenue minus our operating expense to get to 231000 Our service department charges came in at $154,000, uh, which got us to an income from operations of 77000 We get 77000 of course, by taking our income from operations before service department charges. Subtract out your service department charges to get your income from operations of 77000 now, to figure out the rate of return on the investment on these changes, we we use the same formula that we've utilized before. So we take our, our income from operations, 77000 divided by our sales, 616000 That gives us 12.5%. Uh, and, and of course, we take our sales, 616000 divided by are uh, 350000 which that was the, the previous amount. And that gets us to 1.76. And if we take our 12.5%, times our 1.76, we can see an increase of uh, rate of return to, for, for our investment to 22%. Uh, as you recall, that was 20% earlier. So that's a 2% increase for rate of return on investment by simply increasing our revenues and also uh, increasing our operating expense. Everyone sees how we got there? 
Yeah. Great. So, so if you get confused about how, the difference between the two, just take a look at this slide, and then if you go back to – I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. If you go back to this slide here, you can see uh, that we were at 20% for the Northern Division. Our sales at that time were 560000 So in order to figure out the difference, uh, well, what we did here is we, we plugged in uh, the change, uh, and, the, and then we kept the 350 to get the 1.76. We can see that we increased by 2% for the return on the investment. Everyone's good so far? Yeah. Great. Okay. So continuing forward. The rate of return on the investment is also useful in dedicating, or I'm sorry, deciding where to invest additional assets or, or expand the operations. For example, Medline should give priority to expanding the operations for the Northern Division because it earns the highest rate of return on the investment. In other words, the investment for the Northern Division would return 20% on each dollar invested. In contrast, the other divisions, uh, respectively, Central Division at 12% and the Southern Division at 15%. So, of course, if I want to invest it from, from a manager's perspective or even from an investment perspective, I would want to invest more in the division where I'm seeing the higher rates of return because every additional dollar that I invest into that respective division, I'll be able to get back in the return on the investment. Make sense? Of course it does, right? Right. So the disadvantages for the rate of return on investment uh, as a performance measure is that it may lead the division managers to reject new investments that could be profitable for, for, for the company as a whole. So basically what this is telling me is uh, if, if I were to put some investment into one of those lower performing uh, divisions, it could be profitable, but as a manager, I might not do it because of the fear that it would not generate a higher return. And so uh, managers can some, some, sometimes be blind to that type of potential investment, and it may overall uh, impact the, the potential profits on the company. So let's look at this. Let, so let's assume the following rate of return for the company. Um, for the, Northern, for the Northern Division. The current rate of return is 20%. The minimum acceptable rate of return for top management is 10%, and the expected rate of return on, on new projects is 14%. Now let me tell you a little bit about these first. The minimum acceptable rate of return, uh, uh, we, what well, we consider, we consider this for IRR, or the internal rate of return. The IRR, or the, uh, or the internal rate of return, management looks at this as being the minimum acceptable rate of return on an investment. Uh, what this is, is, this basically tells me this is the actual minimum that I would accept on a potential investment. Okay? So here's a way of thinking about it. If I were to uh, issue you a loan to the company, or I'm going to invest in a new project in the company, uh, the only way I would get that investment into the company for a new project would be is if I could, at minimum, get a return of 10% on that investment. And so, of course, I'll, I'm going to run some calculations to figure out whether that's a good investment or not, you know, by running the DuPont uh, equation. But uh, I would expect a minimum return of 10%. And then we have uh, the expected rate of return on, on the investment in a new project. What this is, is if I'm going to invest on a new project uh, and I've run out my expected progress, like let's say, for example, I'm making blue jeans, right? And 
if I invest in a new sewing machine, uh, I'm running a new line for production of, of new sewing machines and new different different models of blue jeans, and these machines are, are expected to be more efficient, uh, based on that investment of the new sewing machines and new pairs of blue jeans in R&D, I would expect that new product line to generate 14% uh, for, for my rate of return. That's just, that's just kind of how I would explain the expected rate of return for a new project. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that you all understood the, the differences between the minimum acceptable rate of return and the expected rate of return for a new project. And that's dependent on... Depending on what? I'm sorry, what, what were you going to say? I was, I was about to say that depended on an investor asset. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So, right. yep, absolutely. Very good. Okay, so let's go through the example. Uh, if the manager of the Northern Division invests the new, in the new project, the Northern Division's overall rate of return will decrease from 20% due to averaging. Okay, let's talk about averaging. So, so, if let's say I go with a new investment, and the, the new investment, uh, and, uh, the, or the new, you know, product line, or the new uh, uh, machinery, um, based on an average, let's say my current investment, I'm at 20%, and the new investment, I think, will only yield me 14%. If I average those two together, Clearly, my overall rate of return will decrease, right? Um, you know, we're looking at probably about 16.5% thereabouts. Um, and that's because the new product line of the new project will only yield me 14%. My current uh, overall is at 20%. So, of course, if I average those two together, my, my, uh, my overall rate of return will decrease. So the division manager must decide to reject the project because of that. And even though the new project expanded the rate of return was 14% and it exceeds the minimum accessible rate of return of 10%, I still might reject it because my overall rate of return will decrease with the new project. Does that make sense? Yeah, Professor, but what's the confirmation that you need to determine over that, to determine the average? Yeah, so, so – sorry, sorry, sorry. So you would average together 20% and 14%. So if you add these two together and then divide by two, that'll give you your, your average, right? It's just that simple. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Do, do that for any one of them. Like, throughout the, throughout the I mean, any divisions, you just, just divide them. That's it. That's right. Exactly. Yep. See, uh, that's exactly right. Oh, so what I'm trying to ask for, uh, I think, the example that you gave, on the minimum, on the, um, on the minimum, average, not on the minimum, average, but, uh, it's on the average. What was it on the, what was it on the, the thing was on the rate of return? Yeah, the minimum. Yep, that's right. Hey, can you go back to that real quick? Uh, I just sure. wanted to hear that. What, was it the previous slide or was it the example of giving one of the blue jeans? It was the previous slide. Previous slide. Oh, sorry. Um, mm. This one? No? No. Uh, no. No. Uh, forward. Oh, forward. Yeah, I think we're going to keep on that. Forward. Is this one? No. Uh, Is this one? Oh, okay. This one. Oh, you were saying it's a five. You know what I'm talking about, right? I think so. Um, so, so I think I was giving the example with the blue jeans, right? Right. Okay, yeah. So, so, so what I was saying earlier is that if the company currently has a rate of return of 20%, and uh, let's, let's say the company wants to start up a, a new product line. And the, the company's going to invest in new sewing machines and um, 
and we're going to create a, uh, a, a new line of blue jeans, okay? And so um, what I would do is I would calculate the DuPont formula like we did in the previous slides, uh, and I would, I would estimate what, my, what I think my sales would be, um, you know, based on this new project, and I would also estimate what my expenses would be on, on the new project to kind of get an understanding of what my projected uh, return on, of investment would be on that new project. And so, uh, and so that's, that's, that's basically how I would get the expected rate of return on investment for a new project. Okay, all right. And just, just for clarity, um, as far as, as far as your projection, you just, you're basically just calculating your, the, 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 whatever your sales, your sales price volume is and, and your, um, your estimated on the, um, the sales price value and the, uh, what else? The, um, yes, uh, so your sales price per pair, um, times yes, per pair. your projected volume that you would sell to get, to get your projected sales. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. And so, and so that's just, that's just an example of, of how I would uh, I would come up with uh, the 14% on the new project. Um, and then, of course, uh, as a division manager, just like in, a, in this example in this slide, it's kind of like, okay, well, is this a good investment or not? Because it'll bring down my overall rate of return for, the, for, the, for my division. Um, you know, some managers might steer away from it because, simply because of, of that reason, but you know, you might want to go with it because if you expect that that rate of return can actually be higher, then it, it might be something to go with. So uh, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that don't make all of your decisions based off of the concept that your overall rate of return might decrease. Um, because if you, if you steer away from a potential like that, you might also potentially be losing out on potential sales dollars as well. So okay, Professor. This is from my from, from my experience and from my perspective. Hey, Professor. Yes. So if you do take on a new project and your average return does drop, would that drop? Could that not be like this, um, in the short term? Because like if you made a good investment, and over the long term it can increase. Would my average also increase? That's right. Yeah. So 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 it's, it's a short term drop. Uh, and that's why I'm saying, you know, don't focus too much on the overall dropping because uh, it will be for the short term. So the expectation is that with that new product line, of, that new pair of blue jeans that I'm trying to sell, that new, that new division, that new product line, um, over time I would see my sales increase and also I would, I would with that res- in respect, you would see an increase in your return on your investment. Okay, and then one more quick question. Sure. To determine my portfolio or determine like an uh, investment portfolio, the time you would average out the individual uh, investments within the portfolio. That's correct. Yeah. So you would run this calculation out for each line, each uh, company within your portfolio, and then you would average them out together. Okay. Yeah. Great question. Okay. So so here's an exercise. Uh, a company, the ship company. Uh, it has an income from op- of operations of 35,000, invested assets of 140,000, and sales of 437,500. Here's the DuPont formula to calculate the rate of return, rate of return on the investment and show the profit margin, the investment turnover, and the rate of return on the investment. So let's see how that looks. So the profit margin, as you know, we would take the uh, income from operations of 35000 We would divide that by the sales to get 8% profit margin. It's not too bad. The investment turnover, to calculate that, we would take our sales divided by our invested assets, which gives me an investment turnover of 3.125. That's pretty good. Uh, the rate of return on investment, I would take my profit margin times the investment turnover to get 25%. And if, as you would expect, a rate of return on investment 25% is very, very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I, I would do this project, absolutely. It's a good
I'm sorry? I was saying that's a big difference for that for you. Yeah, I like this one. I like this one a lot. So again, so just like this example is uh, written out, the first thing you do is your profit margin calculation. Then you would do your uh, investment turnover calculation. And those two calculations will give you your rate of return on your investment when you multiply those two together. Okay, so let's look at residual income. This, this is a really fun topic. Residual income is useful for overcoming some of the disadvantages of the rate of return on investment. Residual income is the excess of income from operations over a minimum acceptable income from operations. The minimum acceptable income from operations is computed by taking your, uh, by multiplying your company's minimum rate of return by the invested assets. The minimum uh, rate is set by top management and based on factors such as the cost of financing, just like I was talking about earlier with what we call the internal rate of return. This is how you would calculate that. And, and so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go through that, that concept here in a little bit. So this is what the residual income uh, report would look like. You have your income from operations. You would subtract out your minimum acceptable income from operations as a percent of the invested assets to get your residual income. Uh, so looking at our earlier example, the income from operations for the Northern Division is 70000 the uh, minimum acceptable income from oper uh, operations as a percent would be 35000 And how we got there is we took our $350,000 of uh, sales. We multiply that by the 10%, which is the uh, minimum rate of return, to get 35000 which gives us a residual income of 35000 And you can do the same thing for the central and southern divisions. So it's sales, sales times the uh, minimum rate of return will give you your minimum acceptable income from operations. The major advantages of residual income as a performance measure uh, is that it considers both the minimum acceptable rate of return, invested assets, and other and the income from the operations of each division. So in doing so, income encourages uh, division managers to maximize income from operations in excess of the minimum. This provides an incentive to accept any project that is expected to have a rate of return in excess of the minimum. That makes sense because, uh, again, as a manager, I would want to evaluate a project and and based off of the estimates, if my uh, if my expected return is going to be higher than my minimum, most of the times I'm going to accept that project because that tells me that I'll be able to cover the cost of financing, you know, through the through the interest rate if, I, if I'm doing borrowing. Uh, it'll also cover the, the uh, if I did equity financing, which is the, uh, the return that I have to pay back my shareholders. Uh, so if I'm able to cover my my financing expenses, uh, and I'll be able to get, generate some residual income, that's, that's probably a good project, and I'll probably accept that. Uh, I also do want to say, so for, for those of you who are interested in finance, um, oftentimes in finance, we, we, run, we would run what's called the NPV, or the Net Present Value Calculation. Uh, and we would plug in the data to get the NPV. And if your net present value is greater than your internal rate of return, then it's a good project and I would accept that. So I just wanted to touch basis on that for those of you who are interested in finance. And we'll, we'll, we will cover those concepts in a later chapter. I just want to... Okay, good. Yes. All right. NPV, that's, a, that's they usually present that in like a dollar fund. That's right. Dollar. Yep. Okay. So I, so I would compare the dollars to the percentage? That's correct, yeah. And, and the way that you would do that is is you would take the uh, net present value, convert that to a percentage, and compare the two. Okay. Yeah. Great question. And and uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a uh, later chapter. Okay. 
So, uh, so here's um, going back to our example. So assume the following from the Northern Division for data link. We have the current rate of return on investment at 20%. The minimum acceptable rate of return is 10. And the expected rate of return on a new project is 14. If the, if the manager of the Northern Division evaluated on new projects only using the investment uh, rate of return on the investment, the division manager might decide to reject the new project because, of course, it would reduce the, uh, rate of, the existing rate of return based on averages, just like we talked about in the previous uh, slide. While this helps the division to maintain a higher rate of re uh, its, its high uh, return on the investment, it hurts the company as a whole because the expected return of 14% exceeds the minimum acceptable rate of return of 10%. So just like we talked about in, in the example I gave with the blue jeans, uh, this, this is kind of like what we were talking about earlier. Over time, we would expect our rate of return on the investment to increase uh, because our sales would increase. And while the division manager might decide to reject this investment because it's below the current rate of 20%, it's still above the uh, management's acceptable rate of 10%. So the division manager really has a tough decision here because, uh, you know, the ROI, while, well, yes, it would decrease slightly um, in terms of averages, but over time we would have think it would have increased, and it's still above management's minimum rate. So it, it's just a really interesting um, decision to make. In contrast, if the manager uh, does decide to go with a new project, it would be because the investing in a new project would increase the residual income, which makes perfect sense because, again, the, the project rates above the minimum uh, rate of return. In this way, the residual income supports both the division and the company's overall ob objectives. So if it were up to me, I would probably accept this project just because, again, it's above management's minimum rate of return, and uh, it would pr produce additional revenue for the company as a whole and the divisions. And I would also think that over time, the uh, rate of return would increase. So would you say the key is key, uh, this to be to get back? To yeah, so uh, I would think over time it will probably rise back up to 20% or above. Um, it, and, of course, it depends on the uh, how, how, how much sales will be generated based off of the project. So um, then again, if the project tanks and it doesn't do as well as they had anticipated, then it would drive it down. And then at that point, they would probably consider scrapping the project. And we, we see this happen in companies uh, across the board, right? Um, it's like Nike, for example. Like they came out with a couple of, of new uh, shoe designs that, w that were pretty good for a little bit, and then they started tanking uh, because people just lost interest in, in the product and it didn't do as well, so they ended up scrapping it. They, they only made the shoe for, uh, you know, maybe like a year or two. And so um, because of that, you know, and, and this happens all the time with companies, right? You know, we see products come and go very quickly because, you know, at the time it seemed like a great project investment for the company, and they, and they probably did okay, but then they saw the ROI decrease, and they got nervous, and then they decided to, to scrap the project. So, so this is this can really work either way, but uh, but you know, that's the risk of doing business. So let's look at this example. The wholesale division of <laughs> the peanut company <laughs> has income from operations of 87000 and the assets of 240000 The minimum acceptable rate of return uh, on the assets is 12%. What is the residual income for the division? So let's break it down. Income from operations is 87000 
the minimum acceptable rate of uh, income from the operations is $28,800. We got there by taking the assets of $240,000, multiplying that by our minimum rate of return of 12% to get $28,800. I would take my income from operations, $87,000. Subtract out the minimum acceptable income from operations of twenty thousand eight hundred to get the residual income of fifty eight thousand two hundred. Everyone sees how we got there? Yeah. yeah. Great. That's a good example. Nice news. Oh, balance scorecard. Okay, this is another fun topic that I like to generally the performance of a company. The balance scorecard is a set of multiple performance measures of the company. In addition to financial performance, a balance scorecard is normally includes performance measures like customer service, innovation and learning, and the internal processes. Think of innovation and learning like R&D, research and development. So a balance scorecard uh, is, is kind of like a, a matrix, uh, and the matrix uh, includes all of these elements and is a comparison to each other. We're looking at customer service, uh, innovation and learning, or R&D, internal processes, and, of course, financial performance. And we're, met, we're looking at all of these together and comparing uh, the, the four as well to understand how the company's overall picture looks. And that's why I really like the, the balanced scorecard approach is because we're looking at the company holistically. And this helps me as a potential investor to determine whether to invest in a company or not. This is actually how I – I have a couple of shares that I own in Starbucks. And I looked at Starbucks from a holistic perspective. I looked at their internal processes, their customer service metrics, um, and I looked at their R&D, and I looked at their financial performance. And so you can do a lot of this by looking at their investor relations, so, for our earlier discussion, we talked about, you know, some of you had asked if I would, uh, what I would look at if, you know, in terms of like ROI to invest in the company. In addition to looking at the 10K reports on the SEC's website or just looking at um, the Yahoo Finance uh, calculations, I would also recommend that you look at the customer, the companies. Uh, investor Relations web page. So if you go to like Starbucks.com and you'll go to Investor Relations on the website, uh, listen to some of the uh, press releases or, or, you know, look at some of the press releases. They will have metrics performance like customer service and internal processes and R&D on there. And having all that information together makes for a better uh, decision in your investment. Hey, professor. Yes. You don't feel you don't feel you don't feel it like buying stuff going to the to the company because when they like try to inflate those metrics to make it look a bit more. No, uh, no, not easy. at all. Be because uh, and, and the reason why I say that is because you can look at those press releases and those anticipations, and you can benchmark that against their actual performance in the 10 k reports. So, mm -hmm. so, so that kind of takes out that bias. Because if, if you look, if you look at you know they'll say oh we expect the company to grow by twenty percent in this next year it's like okay well how did you come up with that and then so I would look at their actual growth rates in previous years to kind of see if that assumption is correct okay right so great question so balance scorecard uh, really takes an attempt at looking at a non-performance. Uh, I'm sorry, non-financial drivers or uh, causes of uh, financial performance related to uh, their R&D, uh, customer service, and the internal processes. All of these are a great way uh, to look at the financial performance of how it can be improved. So uh, we know that in business that the better our customer service is, that usually translates into improved financial performance as well. If you look at airlines, for example, uh, it, it, there's a couple of websites that rank airlines based off of their customer their customer uh, performance, right? 
you know, looking at on-time arrivals, uh, condition of how to handle baggage, um, looking at their overall uh, in-service or uh, in-flight services, things like that. These are all non-financial elements, but it, the better that those metrics are, it typically translates into better financial performance because the better customer service that you provide to your customers, oftentimes that translates into additional sales dollars. Like, like for example, if you go into Starbucks and you get your usual coffee and you have a nice conversation with a barista, you might be, and uh, you like the atmosphere, but you like the way that the place feels, you like the way that they, the menu is displayed, and you like how the store is laid out, that entices you to buy more. It's, it's, it's the same concept applies in retail. Like, the reason why um, the milk is in the back of the grocery store, in most cases, you have to walk through the aisles to get that milk, right? And the reason why it's always in the back is because as you walk through the aisles, you start looking, and you're like, oh, you know, I, I think I need a bag of chips, or I think I need this, these cookies, or I think I need these uh, other products. You really don't need those, but you think you do because your eyes are drawn to them as you're walking through the store to get to the back, right? And all of that relates to the way that the store is designed through innovation and learning, uh, and their internal processes, and so that translates into higher sales dollars. I was going to say the same thing with casinos. It's like yeah. the windows in casinos. That's right. You don't know if it's daytime <laughs> or nighttime. Nah. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. Good observations. So, so, so just kind of elaborating on what we just talked about, uh, R&D would include things like new products, new patents, uh, cross-training for employees, uh, training hours, uh, ethics violations, employee turnover. But that, that includes uh, the learning processes, right, from HR. Customer service would include things like repeat customers, customer brand recognition, uh, delivery time to customers, customer satisfaction, number of sales and returns, customer complaints. Internal processes would include things like waste and scrap, uh, time to manufacture a product, number of defects, rejected sales orders, number of stock outs, labor utilization. And then, of course, finance would include things like sales, income from operations, return on the investment, profit margin, and, and thus return over, residual income, and actual versus budget and standard costs, like we talked about in the previous chapter. It's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of things included in the uh, balance scorecard. Uh, and, and I will also say that these, these are not standardized. The balance scorecard is not standard for every single company. Uh, different companies will utilize different metrics within their balance scorecard. So, uh, like beca because um, companies are in different industries. And so, because they're in different industries, they're not going to, if you compare two companies that are in different industries, they're not going to have the same balance scorecard. So I just wanted to point that out. Transfer pricing. Transfer price pricing occurs when divisions transfer products from one to another. Uh, transfer prices are used to, in, uh, to charge for the products or services. An example, let's, let's say you have Comcast, right? And uh, you have Comcast and you're in D.C., and then you move to, uh, let's say you move to uh, Northern Virginia. And, and in Northern Virginia, in that area, they, they might have, uh, what's in the, oh, Cox is the uh, cable provider there. So, uh, but, they, but both companies might be owned by Comcast or, 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 or a larger conglomerate. And so they would utilize transfer pricing between those two different markets. The, the same concept applies, like, if you uh, move from D.C. down to, we'll say, um, we'll say uh, Georgia. And in both states, uh, they have Comcast, but because they're in different regions, they would use transfer pricing between the two regions. And so uh, because transfer prices affect the division's financial performance, setting a transfer price 
uh, is a sensitive matter for managers of both selling and buying divisions. The three most common approaches to setting transfer prices are by taking a market price approach, negotiated price approach, or a cost approach. Market pricing is like saying um, in, the, in the north, the uh, price for cable might be a little bit higher than it is in the south because in the northern market, they watch more television than they do in the south. Uh, uh, and a lot of it has to do because of weather. Negotiated prices might be um, if I transfer from the north to the south with one customer, I might say, okay, for that first 12 months, you can keep the same price that you you had here. That would be a form of negotiated pricing. And then the cost approach would be if the overall cost is lower in the south than it is in the north, then the customer gets the lower of the of the two of the two within the different uh, divisions. Hello, Professor. I have a question. Would that also work in insurances? Yes, it would. Uh, so, so the same kinds of applies with insurance. You're absolutely right. So, like, for example, uh, if you move from D.C. to, let's say, um, Frederick County in, in Maryland, which is northern Maryland, if you uh, – the cost of car insurance or homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance – They'll be dramatically different because the markets are dramatically different. Um, there's a lot less cars in Frederick County than there are in D.C. So, therefore, your risk of getting into a car accident is a lot less in Frederick than they are in D.C. Um, the and so that that's just one example. So, yes, insurance is a great example to apply to these to these approaches. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. So the objective of setting a uh, transfer price is to motivate managers to behave in a manner of which will increase the overall company's income. It makes perfect sense. Transfer prices can be set as uh, low as the variable cost per unit or as high as the market price. Oftentimes, transfer prices are negotiated at, at some point between the two uh, divisions. Uh, and it's, it's just kind of a visual representation of what that looks like. I, I, I'm not a big fan of this uh, visual. It's kind of a little blurry, too. Okay. Uh, so, so here's how it looks uh, between the two divisions. We can see that um, this is an income statement with, with no transfers. Now let's look at one with transfers. Or if there were transfers, uh, typically what happens is that you would see a, a line item would appear, and I would say, I would say transfer cost. And I, I think that there's a, an example. I, I, I'll show you here in a bit. Okay, so so using the market approach, transfer price of the price at which the the product or service transfer could be sold to outside buyers. If an outside market exists for the product or service transferred, the current market price may be a proper transfer price. This is where transfer price would equal market price. The difference between the two, think of it this way. Let's say you have Comcast as your cable provider in D.C., and you move within D.C., um, but you, you cancel service at your previous address, and um, – you want to get the new customer market price at your new address instead of just transferring your current um, price to your to your new address. That would be that would be an example of of this approach. So let's assume that the materials used by Wilson Company in producing snack food in the Western Division are currently purchased and an outside supplier at $20 per unit. The same materials are produced by the Eastern Division. The Eastern Division is operating at full capacity of 50,000 units and can sell its uh, can sell all it produces to either the Western Division or the outside buyers. The transfer price of $20 per unit, which is the market price, 
has no effect on the Eastern Division's income to total company income. This is basically what this is saying, uh, that $20 approach, because I'm purchasing the product instead of making it and selling it myself, we consider this to be a transfer price because I'm buying it at the market price and then selling it to my customers at that price. This would have no impact on the company's overall income. It's kind of like outsourcing. And the same concept is, is like outsourcing. Uh, because your company cannot perform those services, when you outsource it, you would charge the customer the same rate. You're just kind of like a pass-through entity at that point. So this is a last question. Yes. Uh, would that work on a uh, price match? Like some uh, company have a price match plan? That's a little different. That's a different one? Yeah, that's different. Um, transfer pricing, it really only works within the same company. Price matching um, is, a, is a totally separate uh, concept. Okay. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is what uh, we use the market price uh, as the transfer price. Then there's, of course, negotiated pricing approach. This is uh, basically what this is saying is that the two divisions would negotiate a transfer price uh, between the two or also um, uh, between suppliers. Uh, okay, so so in this example, like if I want to transfer between the Western and Eastern division, the market price we know is at ten uh, twenty dollars. Uh, and so the fixed cost could be ten dollars and that could be negotiated between the two divisions, as basically what this is saying. Negotiated price approach allows for managers to agree uh, among themselves on a transfer price. The only constraint is that the transfer price to be less than the market price, but greater than the supplying division. So basically the negotiated price is typically going to be close to the variable cost per unit, which is uh, less than the transfer price and is also less than the market price. So let's assume that uh, instead of capacity of 50,000 units, the company can produce 70,000 units uh, in its Eastern Division. In addition, let's assume that the Eastern Division can continue to supply to sell only 50,000 units. That, of course, gives us a difference of 20,000 units. The transfer price uh, is less than the $20 would encourage the manager of the Western Division to purchase from the Eastern Division. So basically, uh, something what this is telling us is that uh, the Western Division can easily transfer units to the Eastern Division, about 20,000 units, uh, at a cost of $10 per unit instead of the market value of $20 per unit. So just a summary of that. And so here's how it looks uh, with respect to transfers. Um, we're going to negotiate it. So we can see that the Eastern Division has the 50,000 units at the market price of $20 per unit. Uh, the Western Division would then acquire that 20,000 units that we talked about at a $40 per unit, or would sell it at $40 per unit. The 20,000 units, of course, as we know, is the difference between the two. The uh, Eastern Division, or the Western Division, purchased the, uh, each unit at $15 per unit, which is why you see here uh, $15 per unit at 20,000 units for the Eastern Division. This 300,000 came from the Western Division in terms of total transfer, right? Uh, because the Western Division purchased 20,000 units at $15 per unit from the Eastern Division. Uh, we can see that being expensed out here, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. The 20,000 units at 40 off per unit was sold by the Western Division. Now let's look at the expenses. The uh, 70, uh, total 70,000 units was uh, was 
purchased or made by the, the entire Eastern Division at $10 per unit. The reason why Western Division doesn't have that is because they don't make it. They end up, they end up purchasing it. So uh, the total cost for the Western Division for that 20,000 units that they purchased from the Eastern Division ended up being $25 per unit. The reason why is because we, we purchased it from the uh, Eastern Division at $15 per unit plus uh, there's an additional $10 for the conversion expense uh, to transfer it from the Eastern to the Western Division. Think of that as like the cost of shipping it from the Eastern Division to the Western Division, which is $10 per unit. That's why it's $25 per unit here instead of just the 15 Fixed cost for each 30000 300000 and 100000 and so forth and so on. Do you all understand this concept of transferring? Kind of, sort of. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I'm not, but it's only within, a, within a, um, the company. That's correct. Yes, this is only within one company. So, so in this company, we have two different divisions. We have East and West. Right. And so, each company has their own sales. The difference between the Eastern and Western Division is that so Eastern Division does all the manufacturing for the company. The Western Division just simply buys uh, inventory from the third party and then sells it on their own. So, in this example, instead of the Western Division purchasing it from a third party, they said, hey, uh, let me approach the Eastern Division and purchase it from them in order to sell it. So they sold it to them. That's what she said. That's right. And the Eastern Division sold it to the Western Division. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I thought you said the Western Division sold it to the East. Eastern Division. No, it's the uh, other way around. So the Eastern, Eastern Division makes all the product, and mm -hmm. they sold some of that 20,000 units of the product to the Western Division. Well, 15 hours per unit, right? Correct. And uh, right. But then, of course, there's some additional cost. They had to pay an, an additional $10 per unit for shipping. Okay, so that was the conversion fee, basically, that's, right? That's the conversion fee. You got it. Yeah. Very good. Any other questions on this concept? Yeah. Great. Okay. So we are a little over time, but I, I, I do want to try to finish this up. There's only a few slides left. Any negotiated price transfer uh, between the two? So, uh, again, they negotiated the price at being $10, uh, which was less than the transfer price and less than the market price of, of $20. So, uh, at, so this is kind of more of the same. I'm going to skip this example for the sake of time. Under the, under the cost price approach, cost can be used to set uh, transfer prices. And a variety of costs can be used in this approach to, uh, include the total price cost per unit and the variable product cost per unit. So essentially what this is telling us is that instead of negotiating price, we can use the price, a uh, cost price approach which is simply taking the uh, total cost per unit and the variable uh, product cost per unit. The actual costs are the standard costs, but which are, as you remember from the previous chapter, standard costs are budgeted costs. So they may be used in, in applying the cost price approach. The cost price approach is most often used uh, when responsibility centers are organized as cost centers. And that is the end of Chapter 23. Are there any comments, uh, questions about Chapter 23? No. Nope. Great. I, I appreciate all of you staying four minutes over with me. Um, as always, if, if you have any comments or questions, and if you're working for your homework assignments, please feel free to email me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always here for you, and I'm pretty quick to respond. So uh, if there are no other comments, questions, or concerns at this time, I'm going to go ahead and end this session. And uh, I, I thank you all again for uh, this another great session, and I look forward to another wonderful chapter with you all next week.
and I hope that you all have a, a good weekend ahead.